I said, branding is great because branding gives you a position. It's sort of, it's the foundation of the building. It's great, but it's also dangerous because if that foundation in any way collapses, you don't only take down that, that pillar, you're going to take down the entire building. Welcome to the Let's Talk Business podcast, a project of the p Group. Gain valuable, actionable ideas from the world's top business leaders to help you take the next step in your business journey. And now, here is your host, Manny Hoffman. Coming to you from the p headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, this is the podcast for no-nonsense advice to help you learn, grow, and lead. Today, I'm so excited to welcome our guest, my great friend, Reb Menachem Lubinsky. In today's episode, we dive deep into the world of Jewish marketing with our guest, a trailblazer and founder of the leading marketing firm, Lubicam. We explore various facets of marketing, branding, and the kosher food industry to insightful conversations with expert analysis. Mr. Lubinsky shares his inspiring journey from writing newsletters in a bungalow colony to founding Lubicam, a prominent marketing firm. He emphasized the significance of professionalism, precision, and offers valuable insights in the evolution of marketing industry and the enduring principles of a strong leadership and high standards. He also provides an expert analysis on the rapid growth and evolution of the kosher food market. This segment covers the rise of kosher exclusive supermarkets, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the untapped potential for major brands engaging with the Jewish market. Additionally, it touches on the broader appeal of kosher products due to perceived higher quality, even among non-Jewish consumers. This is an action-packed episode, which I know you're going to appreciate and enjoy. Without further ado, here is my episode with Menachem Belobinsky. Reb Menachem, thank you so much for joining me on the Let's Talk Business podcast. I am pleased and delighted to be part of your podcast. Sure. So for our listeners, I, I probably uh, most of our listeners have heard the name Menachem Lubinsky, but now we're bringing him live to you so you, we can have a good conversation. You can listen to the wisdom. But I think I owe you a, a huge accursed of and the gratitude for all these years. Um, you've been a mentor of mine one-on-one and obviously on the sidelines um, all these years um, for people in the community um, that don't know, um, you're probably the first in the space of, of marketing in the Jewish community. Um, and throughout the years, you've been doing a lot of good stuff. And those are the people that um, that you learn from, not only what you did in the marketing industry, but also the, you know, the values you brought to the marketing space. You know, Today, with the younger generation in the marketing world, we can see sometimes the values get diluted. And the way you've worked throughout the years, you've been a, definitely a mentor of, of mine and also the thousands of people that probably learned collectively between the two of us. I want to start for our listeners that don't know the full spectrum of, of, of Lubicom and everything you've been doing throughout the years. I know that you're also a, very much an activist and, a, and, a, and an Askin and, and many, many, um, uh, you know, some, many, many parts of history of, of, of our community. What brought you into marketing? What was the, for like your... How did you land into the marketing arena? Well, that's a very interesting question, Manny. It was something that I feel that I grew up with. When I was, um, I don't know, nine, ten years old in a bungalow colony, I was already writing a newsletter for the people in the colony. It was something I, I enjoyed the writing part of it. I enjoyed the research part of it. And, and it just as, as, I, as I grew older, this passion grew with me. And um, eventually I decided, I, I worked for many, many years uh, for Abmai Shishera at Agudas Yisrael. He is my mentor and probably my trainer. It, uh, almost everything I, I learned, I learned from him. Uh, even how to put a staple on, on a document. He was so precise and, and so much a perfectionist. And um, uh, and had so much wanted to create a that uh, a kiddush Hashem that he should be a model for others, uh, and and having him as my rebbe was was just uh, the greatest thing that could have happened to me uh, moving forward. Uh, eventually, as I grew older, and I, I noticed the uh, the growth in the community. And uh, the community was not moving at that time, and I'm going back now into the '80s as fast as the society was moving. 
In fact, there was somewhat of a feeling of, of inferiority, that we're just not as good as everybody else in every respect. And I kind of like was determined to change that because number one, I, I felt that there, uh, it wasn't true. We were, we, were, we were just as good and, and producing the same type of products and delivering a, a excellent services. And, and we, we, need to, we need to take that forward. And secondly is uh, to professionalize ourselves. You know, if we, we, want, we have to produce, to perfect our own product and how we go forward to the world, but even not to the world, even amongst ourselves on how to deal with one another, uh, the ethics involved and the truism. Uh, I, I, just, I just saw that as a, as a major challenge and kind of folded it into. So when I finally left Agudis Yisrael 13 years after working for Rabbi Shera, and I'd like to say going to, going to the school of Rabbi Shera uh, and going out on my own and opening up a marketing firm, it was my my uh, uh, aim and purpose to create a marketing firm that would take products, services, and individuals and market them to our world and to the world at large. Beautiful. I, I have a lot of questions, not a lot of continuation to this conversation as far as the marketing world, but I do want to go back because you mentioned uh, Good Sister on Rabbi Sherer. And I know whoever studied a little bit of his style and also the pe- spoke to the people around them all had very similar um, to say what you just said about the school of Ramesh Sher. Obviously, this is a leadership podcast. Of course, we'll speak about marketing, but it's also about leadership. And I think um, you have been a leader and you have been picking, you picked up a lot being surrounded by a, a person like Ramesh Sher. What could you share as far as his leadership style? What our people listening to this could learn from? I think I learned what I learned from him and I saw from others of that generation who, you know, kind of were determined not to be perceived as second class, that everything that they do should be perceived as first class. He was saying it already, if you're going to do it, do it right, do it 100%. And he would say to, say to his workers, he would say, take every project, make believe as if your life depended on it. If your life depended on it, you, would, you wouldn't have any excuses. You wouldn't come late. You wouldn't say that I couldn't do it because I, I wasn't feeling well. You would do it. That's that was his feeling on how and how people should react and how people should do it, and and that started with um, you know even being dressed properly and making the presentation and, and and even as we were walking the halls of government and I spent many many moons with him in the in the halls of government, it was to be extremely articulate and to project a sense of professionalism so that people would have a trust in you. You know, I, 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 there's one story that I can relate. I remember a young man who was um, going to law school and was about to have an interview in a major law firm asking Rabbi Shera whether he should wear the yarmulke when he goes for the interview or he should not. And this was Rabbi Shera's answer. Uh, if you'll be articulate and professional and, and kind and you'll, you'll look good, that yarmulke will be an issue for one minute. If you will not be, it will be an issue the entire interview. Wow. Very powerful, very powerful. Let's speak about marketing. Yeah, obviously, um, a lot has changed since you started marketing till today. And in, and I think it's evolving as we speak on a daily basis. But the essence of marketing didn't change. You know, what market, the purpose of marketing didn't change What's your definition of, of a good marketing campaign? Well, look, you know, I, I taught a marketing course and I've given many, many seminars and I always try to simplify it because some people don't understand what that term marketing means. I, I always say that marketing is a very simple phenomenon. It means getting it on the shelf and getting it off the shelf. Simple as all that. Now, the process of doing that is what, why, why people like, like us work in the field in order to execute the, the theory. But in one sense, I don't think marketing has changed in, in the sense that marketing is very much content driven. Uh, and in the content was, was uh, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, content was important, except it was in a in different fo- format. It was press releases, it was the written word, it was, you know, more published work. Today, there's social media, there's, there's, there's a lot of different, but the, 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 the key aspect of content has not changed. 
And I think that the people who are blessed with being able to do proper research and properly giving the message, you know, it, it is my feeling, it has been my feeling all along that any ad in a newspaper, the most important thing in that, in that ad is the message. If you can't deliver the message as to why people should even look at this ad, then you're not advertising. You may feel good, and, and I find this a lot of times. This throughout my career, I found people that really advertise for different reasons, including somebody who wanted to feel good and going to shul that people told them they like it. It's a nice ad, exactly. But it's not money well spent because e even if you advertise a product and you don't tell people how to use that product, you haven't really advertised. Advertising means going to the consumer and actually taking them by the hand and helping them understand what you want them to understand. And it doesn't matter if it's a product, a service, a politician, an institution, it, it, it's, it's all the same. But unfortunately today, people are so much uh, into the aesthetics of things that they forget that the message has to be there. I look at some ads and I look at some social media and videos and I say, so what's the message? Yeah. It's beautiful. I mean, I, they're painting Picassos. They're painting Picassos. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. But what's the message? What do you want me to walk away from, from this ad and, and understand? And what do you want me to take? A, what's the takeaway from, from this? And, and that's, that's, I think, sorely missing. And that's why, you know, we, we need people like you who's done an extraordinary job in, in every respect. And you say, I'm your mentor, but I have a, a, a tremendous amount of respect. How, and I've watched you sort of grow, and that, and that's that's amazing. And it's to your credit that um, you got it, you get it, you understand what I'm talking about of what marketing should be all about. Thank you, I appreciate it. I want to go back to um, speaking about the difference between branding and marketing. You know, um, there is obviously I don't think there is uh, any. You know, at one point years ago. People didn't understand the difference between branding and marketing and understanding what a, really the value of a brand is. Um, I think by now we see large corporations, public companies that have been able to uh, develop a brand. And I think, I don't know the specifics, but, uh, you know, there is a there is a, a data out there that says Coca-Cola, the brand is more worth than, than the assets that they actually have under their on, under the brand. What's your definition of a, a good brand? And, and, and the follow-up question to that is, what do you suggest clients, at which point do they invest in the brand? Okay, so I'll just repeat something that I told a potential client a couple of months ago. I said, branding is great because branding gives you a position. It's sort of, it's the foundation of the building. It's great, but it's also dangerous. Because if that foundation in any way collapses, you don't only take down that, that pillar, you're going to take down the entire building. Because you built it up to such a level of being trustworthy and, and integrity and uh, whatever else the brand uh, means. So you have to be, make pretty sure that before you go brand, that your product is solid. I wouldn't suggest that anybody that has a weak product or a shaky product should go brand before they perfect the product because it'll come back to bite you in a big way. We've seen in history when there's a scandal, it doesn't just take down a product line, it takes down the entire brand. And it's very, very difficult to recover from it. But if it's done right, a brand is a very, very good way to uh, essentially position yourself as a fixture in, in a particular field. It's where you, you can grow with that. Uh, if you had 10 products, you can develop 20 products. But this is all based on the fact that you've established that this brand has integrity, that this brand is something that people want to uh, look up to. Uh, you, you mentioned Coca-Cola. I mean, Coca-Cola has had, over the years, has had a share of failures. It's introduced products that have not made it. But by the time that happened, they had so reinforced and strengthened that brand that they were able to withstand the storm clouds. 
And, and so th- that's the story about branding. I mean, in our community, not everyone is ready yet for the Coca-Cola brand, although I wish they were. But they have to understand that when they brand, they're saying to the community and to the people who read them, trust us. Why? Because we are A, B, C, D. And when you t- say to somebody, trust me and trust us, that's a very, very powerful statement. And that's what branding is all about. Hey, listeners, are you struggling to create beautiful looking proposals? Is it a hassle every time you need to prepare a quote or proposal for your clients? Is collecting signatures still a manual process? Well, it's time to upgrade to PandaDoc. At PTAX, we use PandaDoc for all our proposals, employee documentation, and so much more. It saves us time, keeps everything organized, and our documents look incredibly professional. With customizable templates, real-time collaboration, and e-signatures, PandaDoc turns creating documents into quick and easy steps. Plus, it integrates with so many other tools, streamlining your workflow and boosting productivity. Try PandaDoc today by visiting ptex.co slash PandaDoc and start your free trial. Trust me, it's going to be a game changer for your business. That's ptex.co slash P-A-N-D-A-D-O-C. You're mentioning a very important point. Uh, you know, in, in Ptex, our positioning is uh, we work mainly with established brands. And, and people say, well, you don't work with the startup. And I, I always say that depending, obviously, if, if it's an existing company that has multiple brands and they're starting up a new brand, it's different. But if it's a new startup, and chances are they might still perfect their product, they might pivot from their positioning where they're starting off with, then branding is a commitment, not the financial commitment. It's more a commitment of what the brand stands for. So if you start off saying, okay, we're going to do luxury products, and the brand is all built around that, that positioning. And tomorrow you say, you know what, we have to come down with a pricing. So therefore, we're going to start the compromising the quality of the product. It, you know, you're committed to that brand positioning. You can't keep on changing. Now, you, now you're confusing the market share. And, and I think that's, that's why like I always tell clients that the reason why we have this positioning in this space where we work with is because it doesn't make sense to spend the money to do proper branding if you're not committed that this is where the direction we're going with the brand long term. So I appreciate the way you explained it. Right, right. I, I, I think it's a little bit more than that. I mean, some people think of branding as a hit and miss kind of thing. They'll come to you and they'll say, you know, for the next 30 days, branding is not a 30 day. You have to have you have to have a commitment, a financial commitment to really reinforce it and strengthen it. And there's a lot of confusion with branding. I mean, I talk to a lot of people that think that a full page in the Jewish magazines, that's branding. Put a nice picture in. That is not branding. That's, that's, an, ad, that's an ad, but it's not branding. Branding is a sustained campaign to exude leadership. I mean, leadership is the name of the game. You need to, to have a goal to become the leader in your category. If that is your goal, to become the leader in your field and in your category, you are branding. But if you're just doing it because uh, are you going on an ego trip or, or, or you want to impress people, that's not branding. It's, it, it, thankfully, there's been a lot of people making that mistake. And thankfully, that has helped our uh, publications grow over, over time to the point where um, we no longer count the pages. Comes a young if we count the weight, you know, because of all the people that say, how could I not be there? Well, remember one thing. On most weekends, there's a lot of clutter. You, uh, I've watched people look at some of these publications on a Friday night with the uh, eyes half closed. And I, I dare say that they have absolutely no recall of what they saw. <laughs> and especially if you don't have a message, if there's nothing to take away, I mean, their eyes will close, not only be drooping, but they, they will close. So yes, uh, your, to your point, branding is something that requires a commitment it requires uh, more than just the average uh, graphic design type of thing. It requires some pr- really professional input as to how you get there because, you know, branding comes in different ways. I mean, you talk to the big companies, uh, a good part of their budget has nothing to do with, with uh, advertising. A good part of their budget is sponsorship. The sponsors in the Olympics spend a fortune of money because that is their brand. Their branding is to be associated with an event that people respect and appreciate. So 
you have to go back to the school or the original school of what branding really is because it is so abused and misused that to the point where uh, you know somebody says can come to come to me and they can probably come to you and say I want to do a branding campaign but they have no no idea of what they're really talking about yeah and uh, it, you mentioned our sponsorship and it's not only sponsorship it's the alignment with who you're sponsoring with like that's also a testament as far as what type of positioning your brand has like if you if you position yourself in a certain market in a certain and and now all of a sudden it's not aligning with that organization or whatever it is, that it's also misalignment. Well, you know, uh, just to, to be a little bit more current, I mean, a lot of these heavily branded organizations are step up step up front to take positions on, on various issues. And, and that's a pretty dangerous thing to do because the, the object of being in business is to be all embracive and, and, and not to exclude people. So in, in my early days in marketing, people were very careful not to get involved in anything that might be perceive, perceived not as controversial, but as divisive. Because, you, you know, uh, as you know, I, I've done a tremendous amount of work in the kosher community to the, po- to the point where I, I've literally been there from, from the scratch and building it up. And, and, I, and I say to, say to the kosher companies, many of them, I say, look, uh, you know, the certification, yeah, you may think this certification is bad. This is a, Remember, you have to be, be able to go to all types of people. So whatever certification you get has to be acceptable to everyone. And that's business. If people don't understand in business that business means making money and business be, means going out and reaching out to everyone, not to just a, a specific class, unless you're a niche product, understandably, you you're obviously are selling to a specific niche, but otherwise you need to reach everybody. So you mentioned, mentioned kosher food. Obviously, I wanted to get into that space and, and ask you a couple of questions. So a lot of it's transpired from when you started, and obviously we could probably um, categorize it in two categories. There's companies servicing the Jewish market uh, and, and there are kosher brands to begin with. And then we have these large brands, you know, the general brands that also have kosher certification. Um, both of them exploded all, throughout the years since you started working in this space and, and, and advocating for, um, you know, for, for the, the cause of kosher food. <laughs> Obviously, you have seen it from where it started to where it is. Like, from your perspective, how do you define it now? Well, I think I think the market uh, you correctly uh, put it is can be divided into two cities. It's a tale of two cities. Uh, you you have uh, our insular community which produces products, and then you have the outside world which is producing products. Now, as far as the insular community is, that community has grown tremendously. We have now up, upward of seventy five supermarkets that are exclusively kosher and are twenty thousand or more square feet which we never had before. What does that mean? That means that the supermarket shelves in our communities have enough space to showcase as many brands as possible. And the consumer has a choice, you know, whatever brand you like. And we, we found out during COVID that we are a self-contained community. We can continue to sell to our own and, and continue to exist without reaching out to the outside community. And then, of course, there's the outside community, which uh, uh, goes kosher. But, but their, their feeling is, is that once they get the kosher certification, they've kind of like uh, f- fulfilled their obligation. So Coca-Cola, for example, is a kosher company, right? They have a kosher certification. The challenge has been how to get them to understand that we're more than just a rubber stamp. That if you reach out to that community, you can actually grow, you can grow the category in that community. If you mention Coke, I think they found out that when they produce a specific product for Pesach, for example, for Passover, their sales go up exponentially. So exponentially. So there, there is a opportunity that I think is lost on, on some of the bigger companies um, in every category. You know, and if, if you take a ride through the Jewish communities and you see uh, the number of minivans, it behooves someone to say, why aren't these companies marketing to these? These are people with large families, the people who are obviously requires. But I could, I, I could, I could um, kind of expand that into so many different categories. They are definitely missing an opportunity. 
early on, I, you know who I blamed? I blamed the advertising agencies that many times were run by secular Jews or Jews who are, had absolutely no knowledge of the Jewish community and kind of discouraged the companies from, from uh, doing any specific marketing within the Jewish market. Today, it's kind of like fed on itself and it's kind of like uh, outlived the, the, the early uh, pioneers in that. But the challenge is still there. The challenge that we, we have a community that even the numbers don't tell the story because we spend far more than the numbers actually tell. The families are, are much, much larger. If you look at the number of people, for example, this summer that go on vacations, that are traveling, even in this, in this uh, unstable environment, you would have to go back to the Orthodox Jewish community, probably, probably the largest group of any group, specific group, that is doing the travel, using hotels, using the airlines, uh, bu bu buying luggage. I mean, I could go, I could go right and right. And then, and then, of course, then the, there's back to the insular community. We're doing great, Baruch Hashem. We are growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, each community has its, its own commerce now. Um, you can go into any one of the Jewish communities, and you have your shopping areas. Uh, you have your online, and um, I think that's the way to look at how the market is divided these days. Speaking about uh, the brands that are servicing the, our, our communities, um, what, what, do you, what do you feel like, like we see new brands popping up? So we see also how much of the trends do you seeing in, the, in our community brands, let's call it, are, are basically mimicking what's happening in the, in the outside world? And how much is, is more our own doing, so to speak, that based on our own trends locally? Well, it's a very good question. Um, you know, I have a weakness for creativity, so I'm, I'm kind of like wrong. I, I would prefer to see a great deal of creativity in our community rather than mimicking or copying what's out there in the general community. But, you know, it's the nature of people to try to make their lives easier and to try to make their lives easier. So you see something, oh, you know what? Why don't I make a kosher version of that? And, uh, and that's, that's been the trend, more or less. However, we've grown by leaps and bounds in terms of, and, and I, I say this to the general food market, don't come to us because we have kosher products. Come to us because we have good quality products that would be bought by any one of your consumers. Go check us out. We're not the same people that used to have, you know, Matzah's grape juice and, and a Yorkshire candle on the shelves anymore. Yeah. And some gefilte fish. Right. So I, I think there's a great challenge in, in, in the sense that we need to open up the eyes of the, of the broader world that, that we are a great resource for them. And sure, we're kosher. And sure, we might be a, a few pennies more expensive because kosher certification uh, is important to us. But that the same, by the same token, that kosher certification is also a quality message. And many people who are not Jewish buy kosher because they have a perception that it's, that it's a better quality. Mm -hmm. And to that, to what you just said, I heard it in the past, um, is it, you have some data points that uh, reflect that. Like it's, it's something that you would see outside, you know, people that are totally not kosher, buying kosher for, for the quality. Oh, yeah, we've, we've tracked that many, many uh, times with many general supermarkets. We're able to prove that many, um, many people who are not kosher by design buy kosher products. There are certain specific categories of products that the average consumer would buy. But we've actually had tests, for example, on pasta, where there was a, a brand with kosher certification right next to a brand without kosher certification. And the brand that had the kosher certification did 20% better than the one that didn't have kosher certification. And it was not in a specific kosher area. Wow. So let's speak about um, um, kosher brands locally. Um, obviously, um, you have people coming to you um, all the time as far as discussing ideas and so on and so forth. Is there still room for improvement in kosher food in general? Like, or is, is would you say any new brand that comes in is actually taking away market share from somebody else? Like, is our population growing that much that we have room for new brands to come up? Or, or any new brand that comes up is just basically taking away market share from somebody else? Well, the good news is, is that, that, that our community is very much interested in new products. 
And, um, you know, I, I see this from the supermarkets and I get data from them. And new products sometimes drive business. Uh, specifically, let's say on Pesach, whatever. But the point of the matter is that the foodies, the eating experience has become something, a part of a lifestyle. And, and people want to try new products. And, and, you know, when I'm talking about not only food, look at the explosion of what happened with kosher wine. I mean, we started out with, uh, with, uh, with three, four brands of Malaga and Concord and grape juice. And today, today there are hundreds of brands from all over the world and, co- and countries that don't even have great relationship with Israel, for example, are just dying to, to, to produce kosher wine because they know that it's a, that it's a good seller. And, and uh, big credit to the Herzog family who's done a remarkable job in, in taking this category and, and, and really exploding with it. So, yeah, th- there is plenty of room for growth in that area. There's plenty of room for creativity. I think where the challenges come in is to, is to try to market this to a broader audience. And also the challenge comes in to uh, not only produce a better product, but the packaging, the labeling, the presentation is very, very important. That we've, that we've, uh, we've greatly improved. I remember I'm, I'm talking about a specific product that used to produce their products in a cellophane, cellophane wrapper put on the shelf. You couldn't even see what the label was. Today they're in a box, in a very fancy box with a window. Uh, it's a, a whole different ball game. But you know what? I, I think our community is recognizing the opportunities and, um, and, the, and they're rising to the challenge. What type of trends could you share with the audience? Uh, have you seen in our community as far as trends or even the larger community in the food, in the food industry? Well, look, it's, we live in very challenging times. We have a very volatile economic uh, situation. Um, just in the last few weeks, we watched um, uh, the, the job market be cut. We watched, uh, you know, the interest rates go, go, go crazy. The stock market uh, t- took a deep dive. But I think we have to take a long-term approach. The long-term approach is to stay the course, to do things right, to, to produce quality. And I even say this to the service industry. The service industry in our service industry has to really be service. I mean, I am still very much taken aback by how the service industry in general has plummeted to new lows. They outsource a lot of their uh, uh, customer service things to somebody who's going to spend a half an hour with you just to try to figure out how to spell your name. You know, not, and you're not getting any satisfaction on, on, on why you called. I think, I think customer service is a key element in marketing. People forget that. Uh, you know, I always say that, you, you know, you have very nice offices and you have great employees. But, you know, that secretary at the front who greets you and says hello is the most important person in your operation. Because that's what first impressions, no different than going on a date. First impressions often, often are the lasting impressions. So, and, and that goes for the presentation in, in the physical plant. That goes for the presentation of a product. People look at a product, before they taste it, what do they see? They see a package. So thought has to be given into the, into the packaging. And, and I say this to, uh, with, with, with full knowledge of what I'm talking about. If your package does not help people use the product, you're wasting your time. You know, if somebody has to figure out, how do I use this? Do I heat this? Do I uh, keep it in the refrigerator? Or do, do I 20 minutes, 40 minutes? If you want people to use the product, you have to lead them by the hand and tell them this is how you use the product. In terms of um, this huge uh, shift towards, um, you know, healthy eating, all kinds of in this gluten-free products, these, these are, what are you seeing in the general population as far as people are going for healthy drinks, um, and stuff like that. What could you share as far as those type of trends? Well, I think it, it's definitely a growing category. I think the... Um, Organic, natural. Yes. The breaking news here is that um, it shifted from sort of from middle and an older age to a younger age. I, th- I think people at a younger age are already conscious that they need to eat healthy. I think people at a younger age are educating their children to eat healthy. You see uh, mothers chasing their children and giving them uh, vegetables for a snack to take to yeshiva rather rather than a potato chip. 
So it, it's definitely, definitely a growing trend. Um, I think the supermarkets recognize that. They have, uh, you know, gluten-free sections and sugar-free sections. Uh, I'm working with a site called Esgesund that has all these specialty products on, on, on one website. It, it's definitely the trend for the future. I mean, I go into some communities where there are basement operations selling vitamins and, and health foods. It's something that I did not expect 10, 20 years ago, but it's growing, and particularly by, by younger people. I want to also touch before we end um, on another topic. I know that you, throughout the years, you've been doing a lot of consultancy and speaking with with business owners or people that have ideas and so on and so forth. Um, so you're probably hundreds of people have sat with you one on one. If you have to look back and say, you know, what differentiates those people that came to you that took an idea and ran with it versus the people that uh, sat on an idea and never made anything out of it? What type of, um, uh, you know, what criteria are those people, you know, one or the other, like, which our audience could learn when it comes to taking initiative and so on and so forth? Again, I have to compliment you on a great question. Appreciate it. <laughs> I, I think, I think here's, the, here's the thing. Ideas uh, sometimes come easy. I, I often ask somebody who says who who tests an idea with me. I say I just want to know when did you think of the idea? Was it in the middle of Shimona Esra? Was it while, while driving? I don't consider that an idea. I consider that something that you need to explore. Now, you can go to your mother-in-law, and your mother-in-law can say, you know, Shefula, it's a great idea, and that and that's important. I'm not I'm not uh, minimizing it, but at the same token. You, you need to do some minimal, uh, minimal research to know that you do it. For example, I've had people that have come to me with ideas that that idea is 20 years old. It's out there. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very popular. And this pe person thinks that they're, they're reinventing the wheel, that this idea, that this idea is, 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 it was never such an idea. It's a, 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 a consummate idea. So before somebody comes forward with an idea, do, do some minimal research to, to, to know that this idea makes sense. You know, in other words, if, um, uh, you know, somebody comes to you and says, look, I have I have a new idea for um, a, a meter on the street, you know, and it's very small and it's down below. What is it? What's the idea? How, do, how would you implement it? Who would you go to to market it to? You don't have to go to a professional yet. When you come to a professional, you say, look, I've researched the idea and here's what, what, what I want to do with it. Here's who I would go to. Then you got something. Then I would spend the money on a consulting session. But just going forward with an idea is not the way to move forward on a business uh, project. Exactly. Like I, there's a line I use a lot, which not every idea is a business, not every business is an idea. Um, and I, you mentioned about uh, sitting across somebody and, and finding out the ideas exist for 20 years. I had more than once that I had to sign an NDA. Because somebody says, I have this mega idea, but you have to sign an NDA before I share it with you. And after signing and hearing the idea, I said, this exists. Let's just Google it. <laughs> it's, it's long out there. In terms of um, the execution of an idea. So you mentioned about making the research. Um, there's another challenge, which we've seen a lot, and I think you've probably dealt with this a, a fair share, which is people say, oh, I need a business plan. And they would spend now six, eight, ten months just figuring out who they're going to use for the business plan and then developing a business plan, only to find out afterwards that, you know, the, bus the business is a good idea and it's a good business, but they have to pivot immediately and change the business plan. How much would you advise now a person that has an idea, wants to pursue it, made, you know, basic research that this is something that they could invest in, that how, how much of a business plan do they need to create in order to, to get started? Well, again, this is something that I've confronted many times. Um, there are people that have relatives, investors, that automatically, when you come to them with an idea, say, give me a business plan. And you may be traveling down a dead-end road because they, they may not be serious with the idea. So my, my uh, best suggestion for people like that is you answer the person and say, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to give you a an email with a short three paragraphs that's going to talk about the need, the solution and and my idea for the project. If you like it, 
and you say you're interested and you're, you, you might be want to be invested in it, then I will go to the next step and invest in a business plan. But I, I've seen many, many people spent money, and, and with me, I have to say it, people have spent money for, for a business plan. And, and then when I sat across the table from the prospective investor or whatever, I, I saw right away that they're, they're just putting them through the motions and that there's no real interest in this. There are different scenarios. For example, if I had a company that was looking to acquire another company and wanted to see a business plan of that company, and they seem to be very serious. They, of course, they signed an NDA and do it that. So you, you have to evaluate, you know, where, where, where ultimately where is this going? Is this person serious? Because it, it, it's, it could be money thrown out. And, and in many cases, it is. I, I, there probably is a huge graveyard somewhere for business plans that were never looked at. <laughs> I know that you recently started a podcast on your own. Um, I want our listeners to know about it. So tell us um, the name of the podcast and, and ultimately what type of content do you cover? Okay, my podcast is called Kosher Today, which is a takeoff from the uh, newsletter I published for 33 years while Kosher Fest was running. And it was sort of the authoritative newsletter for the industry. It got to a point where it had 13,000 opt-in subscribers and people like chefs for major hotels and vice presidents. It had, it had a, a very strong VIP. So people have been urging me to renew it. And, uh, and then in discussing it with some of my friends and my relatives, everybody said, well, today I w we wouldn't suggest that you go back that way, but you should develop a podcast. So that's what I'm doing is every two weeks. It's, uh, it's on Spotify and on Amazon and on um, uh, Apple. You, you can hear the podcast. Uh, I've only done two so far, but I, I, I don't have a problem with guests because everyone in the kosher industry is interested in participating. And again, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep up with the trends in kosher. Uh, I do breaking news at the beginning of, of, the, of the podcast to, for people. You know, and I mean, real breaking news, like the, the threat of shechita, for example, in Canada right now, or the, the threat of shortages for the um, tovim or poultry and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, I'd be delighted for some of your listeners to, to tune in. I, I would imagine, and then I'm, I'm sure I'm right, that you have some very intelligent uh, listeners. So I'm definitely interested in, in hearing their thoughts. And, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to be on your podcast. Sure. For the links, resources mentioned in this episode, check out the show notes at www.ptsgroup.com slash podcast. Let's close with the four rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Sure. Number one, a book that changed your life. The book that changed my life? Svasemus. Great. Number two, a piece of advice you got that you'll never forget. Uh, keep your mind fertile and creative and you'll reach whatever you want. Number three, anything you wish you could go back and do differently. Uh, yeah, how I spend my time, always. Yeah, and last and final question, what's still on your bucket list to achieve? What's still on my bucket list is to um, to get to 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 get kosher to be in a, even a, on a bigger level, to continue to have nachos from my children, my grandchildren, and my great grandchildren. Because as, as today, I just had a, a brand new great, great grandchild. So, Mazel tov. My Mazel tov. Thank you, thank you very much. So we usually only have four questions, but I'm going to ask you a final question, uh, which is: uh, You have been in this space for a long time. You see now a lot of new trends and a lot of new new people popping up. What are your closing thoughts um, if you need to leave, uh, you know, the cloud with a, with a positive message as far as the business community? What would it be? I think my closing thoughts is we can do it. Uh, we can reach the levels of uh, being uh, the most sophisticated community in modern history. And we can be the most professional and we can be looked at uh, in, in a light that people would respect and say, wow, that community, they do business right. They are ethical. I would love to work with them. I think that being a model for, for the outside world is, should be our, our goal because that's what the Rabbi Shalom expects from us. And I think if he expects it from us, he's the boss. We have to do what the boss wants. Rabbi Nachum, thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is valuable. That is why in the name of our listeners, we'll forever be grateful for sharing some of your time with us today. It's been a blast. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Appreciate it. 
And that's my conversation with Rabbi Nachem Lubinsky. My takeaway from this one, number one, the success of marketing campaigns hinges on a clear and compelling message. No matter how visually appealing, advertising if efforts will fail flat without strong content and a focused message. Number two, marketing's core goal is to get products on and off the shelves. While the medium may involve, such as the rise of social media, the essence of marketing remains the same. Number three, major brands often overlook opportunities by not fully engaging with the Jewish market. Expanding beyond just kosher certification can unlock growth by better reaching this community. Number four, there is growing trends towards healthy eating in the kosher market. With increasing demands for organic, gluten-free, and sugar-free products, this shift drives largely by younger generation, mirrors broader market trends. And number five, the Jewish community has shown remarkable creativity in producing quality kosher products that appeal not only to the Jews, but also to the non-Jewish consumers who see kosher as a mark of higher quality. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Let's Look Business podcast. I hope you enjoyed the practical, no-nonsense advice that our guests shared. If you found value in listening, I would be so grateful if you could share the episode with your friends and if you could give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever platform you listen. Subscribe to the show and get notified every time we publish a new episode. The Let's Talk Business Podcast is a P-Tex Group original production. Until next time, make it a great day.